Hello, everybody. I'm Jim Lauterbach, and I'm the GM of VidCon, and I'm super excited to be here uh, today to bring you the second of a two-part workshop with someone I've known, I think, since the first VidCon back in 2010. It's Daniel Harmon. He's the co-founder and chief creative officer of Harmon Brothers. And today we're going to be talking about Rags to Riches, part two, about leveraging your content. Now, I want to tell you just a little bit about the Harmon Brothers because when I met them, they were working with something called the Aura Brush, but they might be even better known for taking this small company with just a few dollars in revenue called Squatty Potty. You might have heard of them. You might have even bought one. Uh, they weren't making a lot of money, but Harmon Brothers worked with them and they took them to a nationwide, super well known brand with brand equity, great retail reach. And they did that all via this direct ROI model that you'll hear a little bit more about today. Now, this is part two. You don't have to have seen part one, but if you want, you can go back to our YouTube channel and watch it afterwards. We will be talking about creating content that resonates and engages with your audience, really focusing on and identifying the problems your customers have so you can convert the sale. Very important. We all want to convert the sale and make some money. So with that, I want to invite my old friend, Daniel Harmon from Harmon Brothers in. I'm going to let him take it away and then we'll all come back and we'll do some Q&A afterwards. So Daniel, welcome to VidCon now again. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for having me. Super excited to be back. In the last session, we focused on doing the necessary legwork it takes to nail who your customer is, what their problem is, and how to present your product in light of the competition. All so that you have a solid foundation for your video. So today we're going to cover how to put it all together into a great piece of content that nails the sale. Um, and just to speak briefly about what Jim mentioned before, he said, I think I think he's right. I think we gotta go all the way back to the original VidCon. Um, the company I was with at the time, Aura Brush, was the first sponsor of VidCon, actually. We were the very first ones to put money in as a company to get our brand out there. And um, we were uh, working with Hank and uh, John Green at the time. And, Anyway, I've been there ever since those 1,400 attendees to see where it's grown, grown to now. It's been really cool to watch that happen. All right, so swinging back to this, um, I'm going to start off by giving you the exact sales structure that we use in all of our most successful Harmon Brothers videos. It's going to sound simple and unrevolutionary, but I promise it works. So pay attention here. This is the way I've spoken. And I've been watching too much Mandalorian. <laughs> it's a great show, though. Okay, so let's pull up the structure. And this is more or less um, in chronological order as we work through um, our way through a Harmon Brothers video. So the hook. The hook grabs your viewer's attention and sets up the rest of the video. This is one of the most important pieces of your video because if you don't stop the scroll, we don't have a viewer for anything else we're going to talk about. So the hook's very important. And the problem, the problem identifies your viewer's primary pain point and motivates them to find a solution. All right, with your solution, that's gonna lead us right there. And then this is right into the solution. And then this is where you present your product or service as a cure for that nagging problem um, you just set up. And then we'll have a call to action. And that asks the for the sale directly clearly. and clearly. This is, where we tell this is where we tell the viewer what action they should take to solve their pain point. Then we resolve common concerns and establish authority before one final call to action to encourage them to buy. We wrap it all up with an outro that gives the viewer some time to take action before the video is over. And so that's that's about it. That's the structure we follow at Harmon Brothers. And now it, I should mention, it's not always in chronological order and not every one of our ads includes every element of that structure. But when you write out a complete sale in this form, then when you have all that footage to work with and you film all that, then you can actually cut it up in smaller pieces where you can repurpose for little ads where maybe you have one that just shows the, shows the solution or one that does the problem in the solution or one that jumps from the hook to the solution and or just the solution the call to action there's a lot of ways to mix and match this but these are kind of the building blocks that we but that we work with in order um, to establish the portfolio of video content that we go out the door with in a campaign all right so that formula right there that we've that i just showed 
has literally made our agency millions of dollars. And more importantly, though, it has made our clients hundreds of millions of dollars. So let me show you how we take all of our learnings we gathered through research last week and put it together into the form formula that I just shared there, the structure. All right, so here's a little curveball for those of you who are taking notes. We're going to skip the hook, which was number one here. Um, it was first on the list, but we're gonna come right back to it once we've defined our problem and solution. That's because the, um, the writing we're going to do in relation to the problem and solution will help inform our hook. So figuring out our problem and solution messaging first will make our hook more relevant and writing it afterwards will be quicker and easier than if we just started out brainstorming right off the bat with the hook. So don't worry, the hook is going to be coming up a little bit later. So to get started today, we're going to jump in at the problem, the second element in our script. We defined the problem last week through researching our customers and our competition. We found the problem to focus on through the equation, taking the importance and then um, the, or, you know, our top problem, basically the importance. You're going to take your intensity multiplied by your repeatability multiplied by your scale. And while this equation isn't an exact science, it gives you some data to help compare to your own gut. And you'll usually see a large difference in the numbers that, um, that will highlight the problem that you should be focusing on in your video the most. And that main problem is what you need to solve in order for your potential customers to buy. If you had multiple problems, that all scored highly in that exercise. Ask me about that in the Q&A part of today's session and we'll be sure to cover it. And if you haven't yet grabbed that spreadsheet that we use to compile all this data from the customer reviews, again, just text BIDCON to 474747 and we'll send you the link. All right, in the cuffed up example we'll be using, our problem was that rolled sleeves were difficult to keep rolled up and in place. And this ended up making an outfit look sloppy and unkempt. With your problem identified, you're ready to build out the core message of your ad, concept that will guide your entire script. You arrive at your core message by asking this question. What is the one thing that people should, rem should remember if they forget everything else about your video? The formula for this is actually pretty simple. You're going to take your product name and say it helps people with, and then the problem, and then to the benefit the product um, provides. Um, it doesn't always have to be this wording, but this is the basic structure. So for Cuffed Up, the core message became, Cuffed Up helps you with dro um, droopy sleeves, droopy sloppy sleeves to keep them up and looking stylish. Now I agree with you that 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 sentence is in itself droopy and sloppy isn't great, but this isn't actually intended as dialogue that we're actually going to use in the final video. It's not for the script. It's just a statement or our core message that will help guide the creation of the script, keeping us on track as far as the concept we want to communicate. All right, once we have that core message, we can take a look at ways to present the problem. The way we present the problem has a huge influence on the effectiveness of our app. So don't rush through it. Our two objectives for presenting the problem are help people realize they have a problem and show how the problem affects them personally. Continuing with our cuffed up video as an example, let's take a look at how we presented that problem. The problem is many of our shirts are made from slippery fabrics like silk or satin and won't stay rolled. And even when we do get our sleeves to roll, they just look sloppy. That's why you need cuffed up. All right, simple and to the point, right? It's just pointing out, look at the sleeves end up sloppy or they end up um, unrolling altogether. And in some cases, presenting the problem can be as simple as asking a question or making a statement of fact like we did with Squatty Potty. But you know who sucks at pooping? You do. That's because when you sit on a porcelain throne, this muscle gets a kink in the hose and stops the Ben and Jerry's from sliding out smoothly. Is that a problem? I don't know. Are hemorrhoids a problem? Because sitting at this angle can cause hemorrhoids, bloating, constipation, and a buttload of other crap. And seriously, unicorn hemorrhoids? The glitter gets everywhere. Okay, so it's as simple as all that. We. We, um, all we did um, to present the problem was explain that in one position, your colon is going to get kinked. 
in the other position. It's not. Um, I bet you didn't think uh, we'd be talking about Kate Collins today. <laughs> you probably did, actually. <laughs> if you didn't think we're going to be talking about that, you know, you don't know our work very well. <laughs> but um, we'll we'll be talking about more of those types of things a little bit later up. So um, there, um, other times you may need a bit more explanation for the problem. And in our fiber fix ad, we had to show the problem of wasted money or wasted time spent hiring a repairman or chasing down the right the right part to fix something yourself. So take a look. You could hire a handyman or a plumber for a simple fix, but that's just asking B. Franks here to set himself on fire. Cause one pipe breaks and you pay consultation, ports, and labor. And my mama didn't raise no stupid children or smart children. She was mostly absent. The point is, I ain't paying all that. Or you can fix it yourself. If you want to waste your Saturday for no reason, just drive to the store, look for parts, don't find the parts, drive to another store, buy the parts, drive home, realize it's the wrong part, go to the store again, drive home again, finally make the fix. By the time you're done, you've missed a lot of precious football. Even if you save money, you waste all that time. And science shows time is actually money. So you're back where you started. All right. What, what we were trying to do was capture the pain and frustration that goes along with the problem we set up. Nobody wants to waste a Saturday running back and forth to the hardware store and trying to make fixes that they didn't anticipate. So you never, you never get everything you need in a single trip. In fact, studies have shown that 98% of trips to hardware store are second trips. That was a joke. <laughs> it was a math joke. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> so some of these will land better than others, maybe. <laughs> we'll see. Okay, so generally speaking, the best way to present your problem is visually. In the most common situation, your customer experiences the problem. That's where you want to show it. So filmmakers have a rule of thumb where they show where they say, show, don't tell. In advertising, our saying goes, filmmakers are full of crap. Kidding. We love filmmakers. <laughs> they help us out a lot. They're awesome. But uh, we do say show and tell. We recommend doing both to make things as clear and as compelling as possible. Explaining the problem as your viewer sees the pain really drives the point home. Once people realize they have a problem and you've got them imagining the pain of it, convincing them that they need a solution becomes a pretty easy task. And that leads us to our next step in our structure presenting the solution. Your ad will need to answer the following questions. What is your product? How does it work? And that's it. <laughs> Pretty simple, right? <laughs> what is your product? How does it work? But remember, the confused customer never buys. So your viewer will need to clearly understand how your product works and how it solves the problem you detailed in the problem section. So clarity here is, the, uh, is always gonna be king. So Donald Miller in Building a Story Brand um, says, people don't buy the best products, they buy the products they can understand the fastest. And we have found that very much to be true. So when introducing your product, be sure to mention your product's name, a brief description of what the product is, linking this back to the problem you're solving, and mention the primary benefit it provides. For example, our intro to chatbooks was introducing chatbooks, the app that automatically creates quality photo books from your phone. Or Squatty Potty. Our bodies were made to poop in a squat, and now there's a product that lets you squat in your own home. Introducing Squatty Potty. Um, Bedjet. Bedjet is the world's first rapid heating and cooling system just for your bed. Gloomy. I smelled gloomy until Lumi. The deodorant for pits and private parts. Purple. Can you still hear me? Okay, good. I just made a funny sound, so I didn't know if the mic was still going. Um, purple is um, the only mattress that, excuse me, the only mattress that cradles your pressure points like a soft bed while supporting everywhere else like a firm one. And Fiberfix. Fiberfix is a special tape that's as strong as steel. So at Harmon Brothers, We've often used the following format as a starting place for our product introductions. Introducing, and you have the product name, the product description, and that benefit the product provides. Now, we use this a lot ourselves, and we have some competitors who have also decided to use it almost word for word. 
Um, it doesn't hurt our feelings at all if, if you choose to use it that way, but the exact phrases are not as effective as they used to be. <laughs> so my recommendation is that you use the principle of the format, but make it your own in the wording. In fact, using the word introducing can signal to a lot of viewers that they're watching an ad. And these days that might be a little bit of um, a turnoff um, for them and uh, they'll likely bail on your video if you go that route. So um, you wanna get creative with it instead. So clarity is king when it comes to explaining or demonstrating the solution. So cover the product name, the description and the benefit as succinctly as possible. All right, let's take a look at how that looked for Cuffed Up. That's why you need Cuffed Up. It's a chic, low-profile band that keeps your sleeves rolled up and fashionable all day long. Every Cuffed Up band is designed using an ultra-thin steel core that pops to seamlessly form to your arm or leg. And with the non-flip silicone cover, Cuffed Up is strong enough to hold denim, yet grippy enough for slippery silks. So now you can trust that the style you choose in the morning will last all day. We're so confident that Cuffed Up will give you a long-lasting and stylish look that if you don't completely love it, you can send it back for a full refund. All right, we've talked problem and solution. So now let's talk about everybody's favorite part um, in the beginning of our video, the hook. So the hook. Um, recently, someone stopped me and asked, why do you call it the hook? And my response was, because it hooks the viewer. But you can't define something by using the term you're supposed to be defining, so I had to stop and think for a second. So this is the way it kind of breaks down. Um, obviously, we all know its purpose, it, the hook in fishing is to catch a fish, right? So um, there are a few more elements that we should kind of unpack here. So let's talk about the hook in, in terms of a fish analogy. So first off, a hook doesn't work by itself. Most fish don't just bite down on this metal thing to let you know they're ready to come in uh, to the boat, as convenient as that would be. Um, you have to entice them with something they want. Usually something they want is food or some form of uh, stimulation. For that, we use lures and bait. Those objects get the fish's attention and encourage them to do something. In the case of the video hook, we first and foremost want the viewer to stick around and hear what we have to say. Once they bite the hook, we can lead them where we want them to go with the rest of our video. Of course, they still have their agency. Um, I've lost many a fish who really wanted to get away and were able to. Um, so we can't just be content with a snappy hook. At some point between when, um, when, the, when fish hooks were invented 22,000 years ago and today, there was a smart but frustrated fisherman, um, and although he could hook fish, no problem, too many of those fish were able to wiggle off. And in response to this problem, the enterprising fisher invented the barb, this menacing looking part right here. <laughs> um, with that small notification on the hook, a barb going in the opposite direction, the fisher could keep more of what he initially enticed with the larger hook and bait. So now what's the analogy? Simply this, no matter how flashy and enticing your hook, if it doesn't adhere to the principle I'm about to share with you, no matter how many people you stop from scrolling, you'll never land the number of fish you want. It's critical that when writing your hook, you remember this. Your hook needs to be surprising, yet fitting. Truth, almost any hook can be surprising. Any teenager with an iPhone can create an outrageous piece of content that gets some, someone to at least take notice for a second. But the trick, the barb, is that the, that sweet spot where surprising meets fitting. No matter how off the wall or entertaining it might be, a hook that isn't fitting just doesn't give your ad the power or credibility to perform. A hook that is fitting means your viewer doesn't have to think about how your hook relates to the problem or solution. No matter how creative the hook, it should serve to set up the rest of your video in a way that is logical, natural, and compelling. Finding that sweet spot is going to be one of your greatest challenges in writing your hook, and really your script, but the reward for the effort in getting it right is success. So now a hook doesn't have to be elaborate or expensive to do the trick. You don't need explosions, cars flying off of cliffs to catch people's attention. Um, a hook can be as simple as a kid sitting on a couch talking about packing his bags for vacation. Okay, I admit it, you're skeptical right now, um, but you kind of need to think about um, 
well, a good explosion always makes things interesting. So if it fits in, let's do an explosion. <laughs> but um, explosion can also be lazy. Um, and I personally love explosions, even when they're lazy. But that doesn't always mean the best thing for sales. So this is where your cre creativity as a creator comes, comes into play. Watch how our writers turn the concept of a boy sitting on a couch into a hook that is both surprising and fitting. Road trips used to be rough. Mom would say, Steven, pack your pillow, pack your stuffed animal, pack your hoodie, pack your flamethrower. I did not say that. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, that was a hook, uh, an example of a hook that it's both surprising and fitting for um, the road trips thing because he's going to be talking about a little stuffed animal that goes with him on the road trip, a cub coat. It was surprising to hear the child's voice, but see the mother speaking the lines. Um, it was tied together and made fitting because, again, that product was all about making packing easier for road trips, combining both a hoodie and a stuffed animal into one. That's what the product was, is a cup coat. It also um, showed both a mother and a child perspective in a fun way the parents can all relate to. So it had an element of surprise and an element of it that fit together. Now, a caveat here, your hook can rely too much on, um, can't rely too much on dialogue because most video is played initially with the sound off, especially on platforms like Facebook and Instagram. So interesting visuals um, like explosions or cute kids or puppies <laughs> do have their place. It can help draw people in. And um, you see that in a hook um, of how we use the mother's expressions to create the visual intrigue in addition to the dialogue. She really we really had her play up the acting so that it matched with the kids, um, what the kids was talking about. And a good hook will employ one or more of these key, key, key elements. It will make people either think, it will make them laugh, wonder what's going on, or get excited in some way. In short, it needs to wake their brains up and get them to engage with your ad, ideally emotionally. A good hook sets the stage for the rest of your ad. It should also help them identify with the problem, solution, and the spokesperson or situation that you're about to present. Now, it's important to realize that a good hook is not a bait and switch. That can be really tempting to go down the road of like, we'll make it surprising, yet fitting, and then you end up doing kind of a bait and switch thing. There's certain scenarios where that might work, but I wouldn't fall directly into that trap. If it's not fitting, it won't work. It's about presenting something in a way the viewer doesn't see doesn't see it every day. And even, even being super clear can be surprising, um, especially showing your product doing its thing. If it's, if, a product that, if it's a product that's really original and something that people have generally never seen before, or, um, or if it's shown in a way that they've never looked at it before, or your product demonstration could even, um, you know, just a simple product dem demonstration can be a great hook. So I don't want you to narrow your thinking down too much. Um, some some things are so inherently interesting that you don't have to spice them up. You can just kind of show them clearly in their own form. Okay, remember your hook doesn't need to be any elaborate or expensive thing to be effective. Brainstorm as many hooks as you can, find the best, and um, and then test them on other people. As long as the hook is both surprising and fitting, you've done your job. And by by test, I mean I mean if you can literally test different content like different video cuts. That's the ideal way to do it, to actually show different intros to your video. Um, or you can test them in script form by reading them to different um, people that haven't heard your script before and kind of see how they react. All right, one, one final tip for your hook. We often like to start with a question of some kind in a hook. It opens up a mystery that the viewer either consciously or subconsciously wants to see answered. And in, in, um, in case it helps spur some creativity, Let's roll the hook for our first fiber fix video because, well, it's, it's fun to watch. <laughs> what happens when you flip a car with a roll cage held together by duct tape? That was a dummy. I'd never get in that car, it's held together by duct tape. But what if you use tape as strong as steel? Manliness.
strong as steel. All right. So he asks a question. Then we pair it with some excitement in an outlandish but authentic product demonstration. That right there is one of my all-time favorites. But again, plenty of our hooks, such as the cup coats hook we watched earlier, are less elaborate and still very, very effective. Now that we have a hook, we've got the first three elements of our video. And we have uh, three more to go. But don't worry, these last three, while extremely important, are a bit less involved. All right. Having grabbed your viewer's attention, identified their main problem or pain point, and having presented them with the perfect solution, your viewer should be asking, okay, so how do I buy this thing? Now your job is to make it easy for them to solve their problem. And the best way to do that is to tell them exactly how to buy your product or service. Oddly enough, many companies are afraid to ask viewers to do something in their ads, and they leave money on the table when they neglect this important piece. In those cases, I find it helpful to share my favorite Trump quote. When asked if he would declare a national emergency in relation to the pandemic, he responded, I probably will. I probably will do it. Maybe, definitely. <laughs> Whatever your politics are, you have to admit that man has a way with words. <laughs> so here's, here's the point. You've just built your case and don't leave any room for vacillation or second guessing or procrastination when it comes to your sale. Tell them exactly what they need to do. Call them to action um, and do it in a simple and direct way. Your call to action or CTA really doesn't have to be much more complicated than saying something like, click the link to get your product name today. That being said, we do have another harmonism that can help you to craft your call to action. The template looks like, th looks like this. If you description of um, of what the customer, of the, oh, sorry, <laughs> description of what they want, um, and then take this action to result of taking the action. All right, this will look a little bit more simple when I um, put it in simple terms. So um, be sure to mention the brand name of your product and don't underestimate the power of immediacy with words like now or today in getting people to act. For example, if you or someone you know sleeps Click here to buy your purple mattress at purple.com today and say goodbye to crappy sleep for good. All right, pretty straightforward call to action. Simple as that. Just write down what you want people to do, being sure to choose um, only one thing, one action for them to take. And for most products, you'll want to focus in on get yours now um, or, um, you know, some other type of call to action for an intangible like a service or an app or a software. You'll likely want them to download it now, sign up now, subscribe now, something along those lines. Um, this isn't rocket science. If you're in business, you probably know what you want your potential, your potential customers to do. And if you don't, you probably won't be in business for very long. So let's get clear about that. In the structure um, I showed, um, in the structure, outline that I showed early, earlier in the presentation, the call to action section um, appeared at two specific points in the structure. I just turn a sound, Keith, is my, is my audio not there? Okay, we're still good. Okay, I'm just double checking. This little earbud keeps making weird noises at me and I don't wanna be just here doing this and you're not hearing anything. That wouldn't be very good. Okay, <laughs> all right. Now can you back up a little bit for me, Luis? Okay, awesome. All right, so uh, just to kind of recap here. Um, okay, yeah, when, when, when I outlined the structure of what we were gonna cover today, the call to action section appeared at two specific points within the structure. Um, the reality is we recommend multiple or at least two calls to action. So place them at natural points in your video, one about halfway through after you've just dropped some sort of knowledge bomb um, or like a great demonstration or even a good joke and then place one right near the end of the ad. Um, the one recommendation we make is that you not end immediately with the call to action. You need to give the viewer time to take action, the action that you just asked them to take. Um, and then another thing is I'd say when it feels like a natural point when like, oh, there's kind of my sale as a whole, like for, if so, some people are gonna be sold after, after that point, after just defining what it is, um, what the benefit, they get out of it is and then showing them how it works and like boom it might be a great time to 
call to action right there. For some people that might be midway through the video, it might be earlier. Anyway, not an exact science, but that's the basic principles. So we're going to watch several calls to action in a few minutes here when we cover the outro, but we'll wait till then because I'd like you to see how they fit together in um, the proper context. So just stick, stick with me for a second before we show those. So if you've done everything correctly to this point, a good number of your viewers are going to do what you want them to. Take you up on that call to action and click, um, click on your ad. But for another large, perhaps even larger, definitely larger portion of your audience, um, they may not be ready to buy right then. So questions have crept up, whether consciously or subconsciously, and here's where we want to beat those back down and help them through them. So our next step is to establish authority with your customer along with resolving any of their concerns and even flaunting some credibility. Think about it. Why should people trust your business? It's a perfectly legitimate question, especially if they're seeing you for the first time. Anytime you ask someone for money, they automatically start thinking the following questions, among others. Is this product or service really worth it? Does it actually do what they say it does? Yeah, but will it work for me? Is this business trustworthy? Are these chickens fed a healthy diet of avocados and lentils? Ignore that last one. <laughs> Maybe it's relevant if you're, you know, running a restaurant of some kind. I don't think you're actually supposed to feed chickens avocados. Please don't feed your chickens avocados. I think, I think the peels are poisonous for them. Okay, so now these questions, except for the last one, are, are generally subconscious at first but a lot of people will be feeling them as they're consuming your ad. And if you can address them before they grow into larger concerns, then they won't be as difficult to overcome and they'll be much more likely to purchase. Fortunately, there are many sources of credibility and authority. Our non-exhaustive list includes um, reviews, testimonials, success stories, Amazon ratings, celebrities, influencers, before and after photos, um, uh, uh, numbers or third-party studies, clinical findings, news publications, creators' credentials, competitor comparisons, etc. The list just goes on. But that gives you kind of gives you an idea of some ways to help them believe that you are what you say you are. These are all ways of having other people talk about how trustworthy your product or service is. But don't overload them. Don't use all of these. People will kind of get bored and tune out. Um, uh, you do need to use something to quickly prove your authority. Just don't overdo it. So let me give you one example from one of our Lumi ads. Lumi commissioned a third party study from Princeton Consumer Research. This test wasn't cheap. Um, that kind of third party study is, it's clinical and um, it's very involved and it is a big investment. And they would have paid um, the same price if the research didn't provide the results that they were actually hoping for. So whether good or bad, it was gonna cost them money. So, but Shannon, the, the founder um, and the inventor of Lumi, the owner, uh, she was confident in her product. And so she kind of put it through this test. The confidence, that confidence paid off for her and we were able to put the following info into an ad. In a head to head, in a head -to -head study with Native and Schmitz, their two leading better known at the time competitors, Lumi controlled odor over six times longer than both. That short phrase delivered a truckload of credibility and authority and money, I might add, for Lumi. The study ended up paying for itself many, many times over. Again, because again, that was third party. That wasn't just Lumi just um, claiming it. So depending on your product or service, different credibility sources will fit better than others for you. Um, some may be easier to get um, than others. Like for example, it's easy to scrape Amazon um, reviews and those kinds of things. Um, but uh, maybe you have hundreds of five-star Amazon reviews. Pull from those all day long, right? Um, eh, or maybe you've been featured in respectable media outlets and some sort of a press blitz. That stuff's going to be really great. So choose one or two from the list that fit your product or service best and you'll be all set. And that, that brings us to our final piece of content in the sales formula, the outro. After you've asked someone to do something, you have to give them a little bit of time to do what you asked before sending them straight to bed without dessert. Sorry, I slipped into that mode. Just for a second, so I'm, I'm back now. <laughs> um, you, you get the idea here. Basically, you just need to give them a little bit of time to digest the information so they can take the action. So if someone has made it all the way to the end of your ad, 
and they're still watching, use that attention to get um, and give them time to act um, and further further brand your product or your service in that time. So don't make it distracting from your message. It's, there's a temptation to get overly clever or funny, but this is one final opportunity to strengthen your message or your brand while providing the viewer a little time to click that button and take that first action. In the following clip, clips, I'm going to show you the second call to action and how it leads into the outro for each. So this is kind of bundling them together. So notice the seamless transition and gives people the opportunity to take action before the ad ends. This is especially important when you're creating content for YouTube because as soon as that ad ends, it's on to the next random thing that might be recommended. Maybe it's gonna be good for you, maybe not. Um, and they're likely to forget what it was that they were supposed to do, so. Um, here we'll take a look at our purple Goldilocks ad, and we use the outro as an opportunity to show some behind the scenes footage that reinforce the credibility of the raw egg test that we used in the video. Click now to start your 100 night trial of Nocturnal Bliss. No pressure, it's purple. Action. Need proof? Lift blast. See, those are real eggs. Not hard boiled, not plastic. Not wooden. I just burst them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. For chapbooks, we added character and a final laugh, but we also emphasize the simplicity of the product. You can install chapbooks directly from this video. Click the install button here, or tap the screen once and click the visit advertiser link here. Chapbooks, live your life and let chapbooks print it. Oh, hi there. This is an actual bubble bath since Chatbooks gave me the time for them. In fact, I'm ordering one now and I'm done. <laughs> I did not think that through. Fiberfix ads, we use the opportunity to emphasize the fact that you need to purchase Fiberfix now so that you have it when you need it instead of waiting to buy and not being prepared. We did that with just a simple final tagline. Plus, order right now and we'll give you a special deal where you send us money and we send you Fiberfix, cause it's already a deal. You're saving hundreds of dollars. Plus, we do have some great discounts. So click here and order now. Fiberfix, buy today and be ready for tomorrow. So that, my friends, is how we research, write, and build a video that converts. We've covered everything from getting serious about who you're talking to, to knowing your problem and solution, taking your competition into account, and then writing your hook, presenting the problem, then the solution, building credibility, calling your viewers to action, and giving them time to take action with an outro. Awesome. Um, it's still got that fiber fix screen out the screen up there. Keith is it not responding. There we go. All right. All right, um, if that all felt like an avalanche of information, there's a reason why. In the space of about an hour between session one last week and today's session, I took you through a large part of what we cover in one of our Harmon Brothers University courses called the 14 Day Script Challenge. Aimed at the 14 Day Script Challenge because, um, well, it's enough information or more um, to fill 14 days worth of work. and. I've, I mean, as you can probably see, but we go into much more detail. We actually show how we go through this process with each, with our real client, the real situation. So our students have seen incredible results from that course. And if you're interested in learning more, you can find information about that by visiting, what's, what's the site we've got there? Oh, there it is, hbros.co slash VidCon. So hbros.co slash VidCon. That'll even get you a pretty great, pretty great it's a good discount, right, Keith? I think that's what I heard. Yeah, we've got a discount on that if you decide to take the course. So, boom, you're all set to go. Um, there's your call to action right there. Practice what I preach. <laughs> okay. Um, in any case, I hope this information um, has been helpful to you. Um, we're really grateful to Jim um, and the entire team at VidCon for letting us spend some time um, with you guys. And uh, really appreciate you putting this all together, this great event, making it available online. Um, and pushing forward amidst all this craziness going on out there. So with that, 
We'll Thanks, let you Daniel. Fire away on some questions, Jim. Appreciate it. I got some questions. I had to bring this though. I have the first VidCon manual or uh, the book right here. And uh, I, I recognize that. One. This. this is the Aura Brush ad. I don't know <laughs> if you can is. see that, but uh, I, no. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to own that one. I think I designed that ad. <laughs> Just to that let was, you know, that, this that is was 10 years ago. Where I was working revision three, right? And uh, I, I wrote the copy for this ad, and I can't believe I said every available everywhere video is being watched. Too many words. <laughs> Too many words. Yeah, I, um, I'm sure I'm pretty ashamed at that ad if I go back and reread it or look, pay too much attention to the design, the same thing. But we were all in our infancy. <laughs> it's nice to get some OG stuff going here. Let's jump into questions yep. there. Um, so the first question I've got for you is, um, a couple of people were asking about, you know, thinking about this is great for selling product. Yeah. But how do you use these tips to make better YouTube content and grow your audience? Translate it for the content creators who are looking okay. at, you know, getting people sucked in and then continuing to watch their video and subscribing. So the two ways that I think it applies is one in building an audience. Um, a lot of what people are going to a specific channel or a, uh, or a specific page for it is actually to solve a problem of some kind. And now it might not feel like a problem to them, but um, a lot of it, a lot of it is like, for example, um, maybe they're looking for, okay, in the case of myself um, and I've got kids, I'm just looking to solve the problem of having some content that my kids can watch. So Coco Melon <laughs> solves that problem for my four year old, right? Um, and then, um, but being able to use some of these principles in the way of a call to action, obviously getting people to subscribe and building the audience. But then also a lot of people just need to think in terms of monetization, right? Um, that you can't, generally speaking, most people aren't gonna monetize entirely off of just anything they're paid in the way of ads from either Google or Facebook or whatever platform they're on. They're gonna need to monetize above and beyond that with either their own merchandising or um, their own affiliate links, or or uh, they might be they might be pitching um, a product that they're um, that they've been sponsored by something along those lines. I think it's really helpful in that way in, in thinking in kind of the broader terms of not just you know creating the content for the, your, their daily or weekly publishing or whatever it is, but um, the business side of it. Right, you've got to be able to. Um, monetize if you want to if you want to make a living out of it. So building the audience monetization that's that's kind of, kind of where I feel like it applies more. Do you have any specifics around using a hook in particular as a way to you know get people to keep watching? Yes. Um, so I I'd say as much as you can, the hook again needs to tie into that um, problem or solution, and we've seen. Um, but let me apply this to ads. Um, I was uh, consulting with um, a client of ours that um, had an app that was free to download um, and it was for kids. It was for, for moms to be able to purchase, purchase shoes for their kids. And it's a really cool app that allowed them to measure, like just take a picture of their kid's feet and it would automatically measure um, the size that their foot was and then they would know what size of shoes they were shopping for and would do that all, all automatically for them. And initially, when they were going out the door with a hook that just talked all about downloading the app for free and focused on, oh, just, just get the app downloaded, then they weren't getting customers that actually later on went and shopped on the app and bought. They would just get people that would download, they were curious, the feature's kind of cool, and then they wouldn't follow through. Um, but in the hook that was more fitting for them, they actually they actually led with a description of the of the fact that it was a app for shopping for shoes. And so they kind of put that they they led with that message from the get go of like, oh, on this app you can on this shoe shopping app for kids, it will actually take their sizes and then and then that became a much more well intentioned customer that filtered through. And so when they download the app, they would actually shop and they would actually follow through and buy. And it made it so their whole thing was more sustainable um, because that hook was tied in so directly to what they, the, the ultimate action that they wanted them to take. I don't know if that 
Yep. I don't know if cool. um, help directly, but. No, I think that's good. That's definitely good. Um, another question came up about humor. And you guys use humor in a lot of what you do, but should there should there always be humor when you promote your products or your videos or try and get people to do things? Is that a, is there another strategy? <laughs> I would say there doesn't always have to be humor. In fact, sometimes humor can be very misplaced, especially if it's too much of a tangent, if it's too much of a distraction, or um, if people are turned off by it um, in some way. Uh, I'd say you always want to resonate emotionally. And sometimes that comes in the form of humor. Humor is very disarming. If it's something that's boring, it's really nice to incorporate humor because it can kind of spice things up. If it's something that's a taboo, it can be really nice to inc incorporate humor because it's something like a squatty potty, the kink pulling, right? It's a taboo subject, but we made it kind of safe to talk about around the dinner table. I guess safe is a very loose word here. <laughs> but um, we, we made it safe. We made it so people would talk about it around the dinner table about a pooping unicorn and, and rainbow ice cream and this prince and all that kind of stuff. And the same thing with poopery, a taboo subject um, um, that was um, made very disarming in that way. So that really served us well. And the other one is, I think um, uh, that it's also, hu humor is really great when you have um, something that's sometimes more complicated. Um, it's not necessarily great at simplifying things, but when you take something and distill it down to its most simple form, um, the humor can, I think, help it stick a little bit better, help them remember those things a little bit better that might be a little bit more complex. So um, that's where I think it's more helpful. But I think the main thing is, is resonating emotionally. And, and to, be, um, to be fair, we, we made an ad um, for a, a nonprofit group that wasn't, it might have had like one joke in the whole thing, it was 12 minutes long. And it just, um, it, it, um, it resonated emotionally and it was all about um, driving donations to this nonprofit group. And so it doesn't have to be at all um, anything that's, that's funny to work. It just needs, needs to be relatable and it needs to be emotionally resonant. So here's an interesting question. How do you feel about putting a banner on the video so there's a call to action throughout the whole thing? Is that work or is that overkill? Um... I'd say, I usually just say test it. Um, I'm not gonna just say hard line, oh, don't ever do that. I think for some people that can work. Um, I, I rarely have seen that where it doesn't end up feeling spammy, right? So uh, let, me, let me kind of provide a caveat with that. So I don't think you would see Nike do that. I mean, obviously a, ban a banner ad, they'll do that like a static ad, right? Like that you'd, um, see when you're on, I don't know, like CNN.com or ESPN.com or something along those lines. Nike would do something like that. But when it comes to a video and something that's static and is a call to action the entire time, um, I, I, I think you'd rarely see a big brand, um, a brand with major equity like Apple or Nike do that um, because there's just too much, it, it just feels too spammy. And what, what I always say is the first thing you want to measure any of that stuff that you're testing against is your own brand. It's like, what kind of a brand do we want to be long-term? Because if you optimize for every little thing that works, that gets the, cl the higher clicks, the click-through rates, that gets the more immediate sales, and you don't ever think long-term, you can spiral yourself down into a brand that doesn't have much long-term equity, right? It can get some immediate sales, but it's not an endearing brand over time. And I think ultimately someone will come in later and figure out that game a little bit better than you can at some point. And so it's better to invest in something that really um, resonates. I think you can still use those types of things. We've done them in the past in our ads where we'll put up a call to action, we'll say squattypotty.com, and it'll stay the remainder of the ad after we've said that, right? We do that kind of stuff all the time, or we'll memeify and do things that, um, especially if the video isn't an, a super interesting visual out the gate, and we need it to come in more of a text form to kind of grab them in of something that they read. We'll do those kinds of things. But as far as it like staying just the entire time and not, not changing, I, I don't recommend it, but I, I'd say always test. But again, is, is, it, is that what you want for your brand long-term? Yeah, test, test, test. Um, suck people into the narrative and then hit them with the buy button or the buy thing. So yeah, see what happens. Um, another question from um, one of our uh, regular attendees, Socratic Kim, said their benefit is that they're a STEM educational quality videos. They're subject experts. They get right to the point. Um, a little leery about drawing comparisons with other creators. 
feels like bad form to say we're better than everybody else in their sales pitch. Do you have any advice there where you, you know, you don't want to go out and make enemies of the other people that you're competing against. Um, they want to see, wants to sort of, the, the Socratic of folks want to feel that they stand up a little bit like Coke, you know, we're great versus Pepsi, we're better than Coke. How do you think about that? Yeah, a little bit of is, is kind of what you want to be, right? If you want to take on that Goliath and you feel like there's a really motivated reason to do that, I think you can go go about it that way. A lot of the times in some of the areas where people are playing, where their product or service plays, there's not, it within that market, there's not enough knowledge about the competitors to even worry about mentioning them altogether. You do, you do not want to give them free advertising if they're not well known. If it's, if it's more that it feels like, and last week we talked a little bit about the red ocean versus blue ocean. Um, if the perception from the average customer is that there's nothing else out there like it, there's no reason to mention these other, mention these other things. The reason you would mention and compare is if you know that your average customer is actively shopping and comparing before they're buying. If your average person is just someone that you're educating, they're finding this for the first time, and then they're just falling in love with your story and what you have to offer, then you know go that route, just single in on that. But if you but if you get the sense that almost everybody is you know jumping onto Amazon and comparing reviews and and looking at this competitor's site and and kind of already knows about these other things and they got to have a reason to consider you over somebody else, then that's where you need to get into a little bit of the comparison. Again, you don't you don't have to do it in any way kind of bad taste. You want to keep it factual. Um, and um, unless you're kind of comparing to things generally, not citing a specific brand name, but maybe comparing a, a category group, there might be some fun that you can have that way. Um, but that, that's what I'd say is you don't want to give free advertising when it's not needed. But if, you, if, if you've got a customer that's, that's really well informed and it's, it's searching a lot of different alternatives to you, you've got to give them a differentiated reason of why they need to go with you versus some other guy. Yep. Good point. Good point. Um, another question came up. Is a little bit more about uh, uh, information design and interface design. Um, but what about the buttons that you use for call for action? Do you have any sense of what the right way to sort of create those? What makes them effective? Is it color? Is it shape? Is it size? Is it outline? I remember at one point reading something from Google where they're like, make your buttons blue. I don't know what you buy into, but any thoughts there? So I think some of those things when it comes to... Um when it comes to color trends and some of that stuff, a lot of that changes over time. Like for a while, I know that it was orange. Orange was the button of choice. And I, I'm talking, when I say for a while, I'm talking this might've been 10 years ago, right? When that was shown to be a slightly higher conversion than if you put a blue button. Um, or sometimes that maybe that's a green. Green means go, you know, whatever psychology is, there is behind it. Um, I wouldn't get as wrapped up in that as I would say, you want good contrast and you want good visual hierarchy. By visual hierarchy, I mean, you don't want that button to be subdued. When it shows up, you want it to show up really clearly and prominently so that they can take action on it or, or read it very clearly of know what website that they're going to. Um, and so I think it's kind of like, it's kind of nibbling at the edges of like, oh, how do you outline? What color do you use? As long as you're following good visual hierarchy and it, you have enough color contrast um, between whatever's behind the button and whatever's in front of it. And, uh, you know, the website you're going into is, is memorable and, and those kinds of things. I think those are going to play more to your favor than knowing the exact color to go with or the, the, the exact design aesthetic or anything like that. I mean, make it fit with your brand um, overall. Um, at the same time as being able to uh, stand out enough that it gets the attention, but I, I, I think, I, I think it's a law of diminishing returns to some degree, and that you've you've got to be to a pretty high level of ad buying or ad spend or a high super high level of traffic for those kind of things to make a difference as much as just make sure you've got really good contrast and clarity so that that stands out. And to your point before, A B test it right. Yes. A-B yes, tested, you, A-B A-B tested. Have the money all day long. Test orange versus blue. Test green yeah. versus green versus purple or something along those lines. You can you can do that and you might see a little bit of a difference. And and honestly, it might change over time. No, it definitely will change over time because yeah. the internet changes and what people's eye get, gets used to is going to change. So yeah. Well, and come back and tell us too. Yeah, totally. Um, 
One last question uh, as we're running out of time here. Um, one last person said, my product is apparel. How do I get people excited about something that's not as unique and flashy as, you know, a squatty potty or something like that? So apparel? Is that not yeah. that right? It's clothing. Yeah. It's a clothing brand. Apparel, clothing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say, um, <laughs> I would say, took a take a look at um, the insurance industry, and take a look at um, the alcohol industry, like beer, and man, like how much different differentiates the beers? Like it's probably not that much in the way of actual like taste and stuff. I, I don't even drink, so I shouldn't even be speaking like I'm an authority on this. But I know that um, for the most part, what they're what they're leaning in on is just the entertainment value of their of the branding, right? When it comes to um, the the particular um, beer that they're peddling, um, the same thing when it comes to insurance. Think of Allstate, think of um, State Farm, think of Geico. On and on, they they find ways to come up with really interesting advertising, but those are kind of inherently boringly boring products that everyone just kind of has to buy. And so that's one of one of your biggest opportunities to be creative is in something that's inherently not creative. You can find ways to kind of breathe, breathe life in that. And I'd say the same thing um, goes for clothing is you can be really creative about the way you approach that. I, I would I would bring in someone that's more creative. If it's, if it's hard to come up with ideas, I'd bring in someone that th thinks more creatively uh, to come up with some different concepts and different ways to, to showcase that. But I'd say um, clothing, so much of it is going to be about branding unless you have something that's really differentiated about the design or the pricing or something that you're doing that's very different. I think it's really hard. I mean, jeans for the most part are jeans, right? Um, and so you've, you're, you're, you're going to have to stand out in some sort of a branding story in some way. But I think it's a tremendous opportunity because, again, it's a little bit of a blank canvas to paint with. I liked your insurance analogy. I was thinking of using geckos to model your clothes. Um, but I think uh, Geico owns the gecko. So, yeah. Um, real quick, I have a question for you. How much did it cost to do that car crash twice? And did you get a permit to do that? Yeah, so we, we did have the proper permits, I'm, I'm proud to say. We were to that point in our in our company where we were no longer, no longer shooting guerrilla style. We hadn't been for a while, um, especially with something like that, that crazy. Um, uh, gosh, I don't even know what the, 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 the total cost to it came to. It was, it was more expensive than what we, um, for sure had spent on some other ads in the past. And we actually had the effects crew, um, that had, um, helped, uh, JJ Abrams on, on, on his Star Trek when he revamped or, or kind of, uh, resurrected the, the Star Trek, um, uh, franchise. Those were, uh, the guys that were helping us out on those effects of tossing those cars off the cliff. But that was that was one of the funnest days of work of my entire life. <laughs> of that looked like a blast. My like was boy. Yep. That looked crazy. Um, yeah. So um, last question for you. Uh, the, a couple of people are asking if they could get copies of the slides. I don't know if you have an email address or if you want to give out copies, but let me know. I mean, we can always tell people afterwards. We will be posting this on YouTube. So, you know, it might be a way to keep people coming back and, and connecting with you on the, on the topic. So just let me know on that. There, there it is. is. Get your slides there. there. Daniel, great, great, great stuff. Two wonderful sessions. Uh, really appreciate you showing up. Uh, and thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jim. It's always fun. Yep, always fun. So just a couple of housekeeping notes. Thanks to everybody who joined us here today. Make sure and keep the conversation going on our Discord server. Uh, you can get there, VidCon, head to Discord. Uh, a lot of great stuff happening there. What's coming up? Well, this week on Thursday at 3 p.m. East Coast time, Wally Wildbacker, one of the top audience development experts out there, will be back in his, I think, every other week AMA answering all your growth hacking questions. So everybody who asks questions about colors and, and video and building your audience and things like that, stop by our Discord server at 3 p.m. East Coast and Wally will answer your questions for you. And then at 6 p.m., same day, the TikTok crew, the house that nobody wanted, will be doing a Q&A. So if you want to know what it's like to live in a house with a bunch of TikTokers and why they do what they do, you got to watch that session too right here at VidCon now. And then next week, November 17th, Zoomers in Mental Health, How Gen Z Navigates Crises. We have an AMA also on November 18th with Young Don, the sauce god. I actually don't know if that means I'm going to be cooking or not, but I like a sauce god anytime I can see one. Uh, our Mexico team will be doing a 
best practices in influencer marketing focused on Latin America, also on the 18th of November. On the 19th, we have an AMA on our Discord with audience development expert, Greg Jarbo, who will be talking about uh, building your channel and building your audience. And then finally, also on November 19th, we have a workshop, a dance class with Jason Rodello. That's it. I'm Jim Lauterbach. Thanks for watching VidCon Now. Thanks to the Harmon Brothers. We will see you at another session and we will see you on our Discord server. See you later.